Hi everybody, this is Dr. Lynn Tran McDonald and welcome to the Wild and Precious Optimal Living Show and where we focus on increasing resilience of brain, body, and emotional health and we do that by bringing to you resources as well as valuable unique information to really help to inspire you uh, to really do something different, right? To explore areas that can increase your overall uh, resilience. And it's not just about physical health. It is also about mental, emotional states. It's about our financial states as well too, career health and relationship health, so many different aspects. And so with that said, as your host, I'm, I'm you know, Dr. Lynn Tran McDonald. I, run this show every Friday at 2.30 p.m. with my husband, Dr. Sam, when we get to switch and take turns. Um, and for today, I have a wonderful guest, uh, Miss Ying Ong, who is an educator and equity activist. And I'm really, really grateful to be able to have Ying on the show, and um, we'll be able to explore more and share, have her share more of her experience personally and professionally. And the idea is hopefully it'll be able to give you more insight into this challenging time when there is so much discussion about race. And so before we get started, I just want to be able to share a, you know, a note or a, sh a positive or lesson that I actually, you know, experience in our office. So Dr. Sam and I, we see a lot of different types of practice members who come in with different health and um, physical uh, symptoms and one of the biggest ones that we are really passionate in being able to serve are kids who struggle with ADD, ADHD, and also we support families who um, with kids who struggle with autism. It's a, honestly a really new population for us to serve, and we're really grateful to be able to have the skills and tools to be able to support families in this process. And one thing that I feel like it's easy to take for granted is sometimes we get so caught up in the busyness of every day and focused on what's going on in our personal lives that sometimes when things feel like uh, we're other people or we come across people who aren't maybe having a great day or being challenged or or you know, we might take it personally and one of the biggest things that I'm reminded of is as I'm working with kiddos or you know who are struggling and parents are putting in so much energy is just how much energy is they have too to, in order to take care of putting their kids first. So I'm a parent myself, but it's really important to recognize that some, you know, if you notice a person having a rough day, it might, it's not tor targeted towards you. It's likely they're struggling with their own personal um, reasons as well too, whether it's taking care of someone who's, who's sick or taking care of kids or taking care of, of, of a project that it, you know, they're, they're struggling with. So just being able to realize that, um, you know, it's, it's understanding a person and taking the time to check in with them um, and understand the context of where they're coming from as well too. So anyway, lesson for, for, the, for the week. And so I'm really grateful to be able to have that experience and learning from my practice members. Now with that said, I'm excited to have Ms. Ying Ong on the show today. And this is an extremely, sensitive time and I don't I'm really certain that for the listeners out there you're noticing this on your news feed on social media on Facebook on the news channels news outlets as well too there is a high it's undeniable that there is a lot of vigilance because there's a cocktail of 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 issues going on obviously the uncertainties with COVID-19 then there are protests there are riots there are you know um a lot of different cha challenges right now that's not going on simply in our country but now globally where people are questioning their sense of identity and who they are and how do they relate to each other and their neighbors and their families and the color of uh, the the conversation of race comes up but then there's the uncertainties behind it as well too so you know there's a lot of judgments and opinions that I that I see every single day and I hear and then even have conversations about with my friends. And there's also a lot of um, fear behind it as well too. And so with that said, it feels like a really loud and unsafe time when we are exploring these areas and having conversations, discourse about race. And you know, I feel like it's a very important conversation to have 
mainly, obviously, it's like, well, what is a, how does this relate to health? Well, when we feel threatened, we're, we're in fear, we feel unsafe, automatically it throws our body into a physiology of a fight, flight, sympathetic state. Now, imagine that we're constantly bombarded by this. Imagine that our social construct is being challenged right now, we, regardless of you're white, you're Asian, you're Latino, or you're black. There is, we are being challenged with our social construct and how we understand the world. And without necessarily diving deep into that or not really truly exploring that, but then feeling conflicted and not having a place to express ourselves, that can naturally throw ourselves into a place of fight flight state. And that chronic fight flight state can harm our emotional health, our physical health in the long run as well too. So mind body is very much, very much tied in. And so I feel like this is a very important time to bring Ying on to really facilitate a conversation, I think, behind that. And so, um, you know, Ying, thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And so um, I wanted to be able to just kind of give you a, give a background to everybody of who you are and then feel free, feel free to throw yourself in in terms of, you know, anything that you want to add in as well, too. But I actually am really grateful because I've known Yang since college. We actually went to CU Boulder together. And it's really, really cool to be able to stay connected with a classmate, an alumni, and, um, and she currently is an educator at, in the Cherry Creek School District. Uh, she teaches the elementary school level, as well as she's an English language support teacher, meaning she supports students in the English, uh, where learning English is their second language. And I'm very lucky, like I mentioned, to have known her since college, where during that time I was exploring who I was and the friends I wanted to surround myself with. and. Um, came across the sorority Sigma Psi Zeta, where actually Ying was one of the founding members of this charter. And it's a sorority to support women, to ex encourage them, to advocate for their exploration and who they are in personal growth um, and knowledge, and also just feeling like there's a sense of unity as they're navigating through the challenges of, uh, of being a different race. And so she also furthered her study at Regis University and attained not just one, but two <laughs> master degrees as well too. And so the first she focused on is culturally and linguistically diverse education. And the second um, degree she focused on was educational leadership. So with that said, what an honor, Ying, to have you um, join us because you are bringing in a wealth of knowledge professionally and I know personally as well too, to shape who you are. So thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to your intro for everybody else to hear about? No, you did well, thank you. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I wanted to ask you then, first of all, what is your driving factor? What, how is your personal experience or what is your initial motivation to guide you to, to be an educator? And more specifically, why focus on equity? And how is that, how has that, is that shaped by some personal experience or professional? What does that look like? Yeah. So I am second generation. So meaning my parents uh, were Chinese. Um, so, but my parents were born in Vietnam and they were there during the Vietnam War. And so they are refugees and they had to leave Vietnam and come to the States. Um, thank goodness for them being able to open up their borders and, and my parents were able to come here. So as a second generation, um, American uh, with parents with limited English and spoke predominantly Cantonese and Vietnamese, I had to learn how to navigate <laughs> and um, thank goodness for schools, right? And that is the first place where I learned English and really getting, um, yeah, that social interaction and getting an education. And so when I think about why I wanted to be a teacher, I think it's so important that education was there. My parents couldn't help me right, with, with a language barrier. Um, and so I relied on the school system. I relied on teachers. And so I remember my English language teachers and um, so happy uh, to have that because I am here because of those teachers. And so I'm thinking about where I am now. I wanted to go back and recognizing that uh, that actually was my only Asian teacher in my K-12 education. 
was my ESL teacher. And so when I thought about that, I was like, no, there needs to be a change. I need to see more Asian teachers in the field. And so when I see my Asian students in the classes, there is already that affinity and knowing that I can connect with them on um, a different level, you know, and so that was a driving force for me to go into education. Um, going into the equity piece that I can't erase that I am Asian. And so growing up as a kid, and I, I was in fourth grade, and that's when I realized I was different and that I was Asian. And from my K-12 education growing up, you know, we deal with all of the stereotyping, the biases, the, my name, um, you know, my maiden name was Chung, so it's Ying Ting Chung. You can only imagine how mean the kids can be. And so that, those moments made me realize that I am different, right? And, um, and so there was a lot of pain, a lot of hurt there. And it took time over years to really understand who I was. And so now as an educator and going back into the educational system, I wanna make sure that we're addressing those biases. Everyone has biases, I have bias. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of me being in that space to be able to facilitate those questions and say, hey, why did you say that? Um, how can we say in a better way so that we're um, being more inclusive? And so that is my drive, is to make that change so that students feel um, wanted in our classrooms. Absolutely, that's wonderful that in terms of how that your own personal experience going through ESL and trying to understand your own true identity and how that helps you um, be, become a better teacher too, and not only in being in the field that you are as well too. Um, are you have you noticed then as a, an instructor now or as an ESL teacher have you noticed that there are some limitations then and and it's not necessarily just for Asian Americans but as far as children to explore and I we're asking we're focusing on children and education first because I'm a mom myself you're a mom and so it's it's the idea of like, we ideally, we both want to bring our kids to be socially and racially conscious and aware and be healthy about who they are as well too. Um, are you noticing that there are any challenges being an educator in, in particularly as you're trying to advocate for equity? Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's something that we need to acknowledge is that um, some people may see that there has been progress in being able to address race and having racial discussions and addressing racism, yeah. but that is not the case. Um, the things that I experience as a child is still present in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and the best that I can do is having those conversations with my students, but when we look at the whole entire edu educational system, the structure isn't not quite there yet to be able to talk about race. Something that we need to recognize is that nationwide, 90% of teachers are white and only 10% of teachers are, are people of color. And so we are in this place right now that people are wanting to talk about race. But we have been socializing and, and normalized that race is a taboo issue and that we shouldn't talk about it. But what ends up happening is we have this negative effect on our students. They aren't allowed to be themselves because people lean on being colorblind and lean on just being kind. But it's beyond that, and that's kind of what we're working through right now, um, is having those discussions. What does that look like to really understand who you are as an Asian person, as a black person, as a white person, as we interact with each other? And so for sure, I mean, the work is not done, and it's going to be ongoing, um, but definitely a lot of those challenges are still there. Mm, yeah. and. So could you give an example from your personal experience and maybe when you're growing up, what was what were some of the um, situations that you felt like you realized that you were different? And, you know, obviously I have my own personal stories too, but for you, what was your experience and what are you witnessing that's, like when you mentioned colorblind as well too, what does that really mean for a student or for yourself too? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. Um, something that a lot of people might experience is that the cafeteria moment. You know, my parents uh, being Chinese Vietnamese, what, what do I bring to lunch? I would bring Chinese and Vietnamese food 
And so we all have that cafeteria moment where we realize we are different. Mm -hmm. And um, and at that point, even at a very young age, I couldn't really articulate what was going on. But I knew I wanted to be just like everyone else. So I had to my parents, I don't want you to give me food anymore. I want to be able to buy cafeteria food just so that I can be just like everyone else. So for me, I was already starting to lose my identity because I wanted to blend in. Um, and, and those were the conversations that we weren't having in the classroom, not that I can remember, of you know adults and other kids just you know affirming who you are and accepting those differences. Um, and so, and, that, and that's what's important that we need to bring to light when we see those things happening. Or even um, when I was younger, when I didn't want to be identified as Ying, I would use uh, my English name that was given by my doctor. Um, he gave me the name Rebecca when my parent, when I was born. He um, had made the decision to give me an English name, and when I look back at my birth certificate, my nurse's name was Rebecca. But even then, and just thinking about that, how ingrained of what it means to be a quote unquote American. Um, he had a, a, he felt like he had the right to give me an English name. So in those moments growing up, when I felt like I wanted to be identified as more white and more American, I went by Rebecca. And so how many times do we do that to ourselves? Will we deny who we are in our culture just so that we can fit in? And that's really good awareness. And I just want to be able to ask the listeners too, in turn, what are some things that you feel like you've let go of your own identity in order to blend in, in order to fit in. And all of us in some way or form want to feel like we belong, right? But then to what degree do we say, no, this is truly not who I am and it, it's okay for me to let my own unique self um, be sh sh shining. I definitely can relate to that being, um, you know, for my, my parents, when I was born, my parents, um, they gave me Lynn, and it's spelled L-Y-N-N, as they, automatically their thought process just is like, she has a Chinese name, and there's an English name that's similar to that, and she'll fit in. And so automatically, parents are, are conscious about, well, the names would be, you know, they may, she may be picked on, things like that. And there's a, those are true um, debates that parents have in terms of how will my child navigate in this world, but still uphold their own personal culture as well too and find that and appreciate that background and I think um, so absolutely so as far as you know you personally working with kiddos in the education like they're still young right second grade they're still trying to figure out the world figure out who they're what it's like to have friends figure out uh, you know what's it's like to be in the stu as students and have you know and now there's COVID on top of it, so it's navigating this new technology, new system of, of, um, of interacting with each other in the classroom or even on, online. And so my question is, for you taking your personal experience, what are some things that you do or you take the aspect of being an activist and you're kind of setting some of those little nuggets in for students to, help, to actually maybe give them permission to explore themselves or to understand who they are, to appreciate who they are. Yeah, I think in education, and just when people want to be validated, the first thing we need to do is listen. Yeah. And whether it's online, whether it's in person, mm -hmm. that is the first thing we need to do. Mm -hmm. And something that I'm trying to um, constantly work on is changing that classroom dynamic where I'm not the authoritative you know, leader in there and telling me this is how it's going to be, but really flipping it and really validating and affirming the kids that are in front of me and saying, you know a lot, you've experienced a lot, even though you're young, but you're starting to understand how you fit in with the world. And so we need to provide those opportunities for them to speak. And so we talk a lot about like teacher talk and I'm guilty of it. I, I I might talk a lot, you know, and um, I have to check myself and say, give those opportunities for the kids to talk so that they can bring in their own lives, so they can share with each other. So how do we address our differences is to be able to hear and listen and learn from one another. Um, when we don't talk about it, then there ends up being some shaming or some, um, yeah, some denying of self. Um, and so that's the thing is, is shifting in education is, is we need to just listen and provide those opportunities for the kids to speak. Absolutely. 
So with that said, you know, as a parent and how does that translate to parenthood? How does it translate to to having a, a conversation at home about race? And I know um, both Ying and I, we are actually part of a Facebook group called Denver Asian Mom Extraordinaires. And, and in that group, there are a, a collective of moms from different experiences, whether they're adoptees or they're um, part of an interracial marriage um, or they are of Asian um, heritage descent. So the, all these different moms, and there's a question that one mom had posted, and she said, are you having a conversation with your kids about race? And especially that it's laid in, in the news in terms of all the different um, conflicts that are out there, all the different opinions, and you know, it's, un, it's unavoidable. So, and then some parents are, I'm not arguing for or against, but some parents are saying, you know, I don't talk about race. And then other parents are saying, I do, and we address it this way, and uh, little small bits, or we read books, different things. And it's really fascinating to see the gamut of it. And at the same time, with my three-year-old who hasn't started school yet, I'm starting to question, well, how does that relate to me as a parent? And how does that relate to me because I'm part of an interracial marriage? And so how does that define, how does my own personal experience define my sons and influence my son? And same with what he sees and witnesses with um, my husband and myself. So how does your personal, ex your professional experience and just what you shared, especially in terms of listening, um, how does that translate or to, to parenthood at home? And what would you give advice for parents who are struggling right now at this time and, or feeling conflicted? What would you share in that aspect? Yeah. Um, something that I've been seeing lately is a lot of people posting um, diverse books. So um, that's a start, definitely. Um, but when we get books, we also need to have that critical um, look. Uh, the book may show different people of color and it's diverse racially, but then we got to think about where are those perspectives coming from. And so isolate race and look at the authors. So if it's a, a, a book cover and it's a, a little black girl, is the author also black? Because your lived experiences um, tell a different story, right? If you're leaning into the, your own experience, you're going to tell a different story. Yeah. Um, and so that is something that I've done in, I'm actually um, going through my own classroom books as well as uh, my son's library and really being critical with the books that I have. If I am going to be sharing experiences of someone different from us, is it authentic? And is it coming from someone who has that lived experience? Um, and, and we have to normalize race. When they're little, they start recognizing, oh, you're the same. Oh, no, you're different. And already my son is saying that this is the same. This is different. And he is almost three. And so what is important is that we start normalizing that. And whether you think the kids uh, understand race, they're already building and constructing their idea of what race is. And so race could be positive, it could be negative, but then being mindful of what we're doing um, is important. And so for me, um, I don't know if you heard about the sociology experiment where they had a black doll and a white doll. and um, the kids would come up and they, they would, uh, um, the researchers would ask them, which doll would you want? Would you want the white doll or would you want the black doll? Mm. Most of the kids wanted the white doll, including black children. Mm. And so in thinking about that, right, we are socially constructing already that whiteness, the lighter you are, is better. Yeah. And the darker you are, you are um, considered bad. And so we normalize that, like my son, he has a black doll and he has an Asian doll. Yeah. And how important is that? That we normalize all different races. So if your belief is that we should have a diverse representation, even showing, um, like you said, like interracial, you're in an interracial relationship and, um, and your son, how many of your books show that? You know, the multiracial group. How many books show uh, GLBT issues? How many books actually show kids that have a learning disability or physical dis disability, whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. And really analyzing what is there, because as you're reading your books with your children, they're already starting to make an understanding of how they fit with everyone else. And 
when they see someone in real life, someone who ha is in a wheelchair or um, who has special needs or whatnot, yeah. the kids, there's that awkward moment, like, shh, sh don't talk about it. Yeah. But there will be responsibility in that maybe you should have had that conversation first so that they're not shocked when they do some meet someone in real life who is different. Yeah, yeah. Or even to that, too, I've heard, you know, I, I've had um, practice members who come in, and for instance, I had a practice member walk in with a cane, and a, a three-year-old was in there with her mom, and she's like, just really directly and saying, how, you know, why are you walking with that? And even just that question, and obviously my practice member, she was comfortable in answering her question. She's like, well, I, you know, I'm struggling with walking right now, and that's why. And her mom, I felt like, picked up so beautifully. It's like she has had that practice and that awareness and saying, yeah, sometimes people struggle, and, you know, but look at, you know, how, you know, how it's support supporting her, and it's just this there's not an awkwardness when you take the time to actually like consider or have that um, thought process or that um, I guess training behind it ahead of time in terms of really thinking through like when this happens how do I want to have the conversation with my kiddo and I think you know the truth is for me it makes me think about do we have any toys my kids really into cars right now so they just like on the car <laughs> but, like, but it's true it's like how many books do we have right now that embrace different studying different cultures or see different colors or um, being able to or even the things that we watch on movies as well too you know um, and that's really really true I think too is it also reflects too in terms of as a parent where when I'm actually going through these books with my child where how am what's my response what's my experience with that like um, being able to um, to go th read the material and then maybe even for myself to question like what's my comfort level and and this and why is it there to begin with I think there's there's some self awareness that's that's be behind a lot of this too as we're teaching our, our kiddos and going through a lot of the mediums with our kiddos as well too do you agree yeah for sure yeah. for sure I mean I just think about um, like growing up I didn't have a lot of books and even in school Asians um, you know and that's that's kind of where we sit. Right, yeah. it is. It, it's it tends to be this binary of black and white. Mm -hmm. but where are the Asians? You yeah. know, and so um, I have been very intentional in making sure that my son Ashton will make sure that he will have lots of books and things around him that are um, centered around Asians. You know, so that because I want to make sure that his identity is affirmed. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think that's really powerful, and I think. Um, for me, that's why I initially approached you, Ying, was, you know, so I actually co-admin co for the Dames group, which which I mentioned earlier before. It's a Facebook group for um, moms, diverse moms, um, mostly if they're from of Asian heritage or Asian um, descent or uh, related to the Asian culture in some way, a form. Um, and, and as with George Floyd or with, with the protests and the riots and and there's a there's here and trying to hold space for how my friends feel and then holding space for what I was feeling emotionally sometimes I honestly felt stuck and how to have a conversation it started making me think about what am I repressing what have I been repressing for so long that now it's uncomfortable to bring it up because I feel uncertain about it I'm being challenged and when we talk about um, black lives matter and what area am I truly being genuine in black lives matter because the reality is as an Asian American like you know I was born and raised in Colorado my parents have really my parents are immigrants and they have really strong um, cultural influence of background as well too and and I was honestly brought up in a way that I was raised prejudice, not just towards blacks, but so, in so many different cultures that were out, that was outside of the Chinese culture, even amongst other, towards Asians too. So having to learn to break down those beliefs and values that no longer serve me, and that's not true to me who I am now. But I realized during this time, Ying, when I came to you, I was really struggling. I was, I felt there was a lot of emotion to it. I felt hurt when, I heard, like, hearing stories of how 
Asian community was attacked because of COVID, because of the Chinese virus. And how did I feel with that? How does, and feeling unsafe actually, honestly, and going to even go to the grocery store or taking my kiddo out and without feeling self-conscious, not because of spreading, but it was also of my color. And so I came to you um, and we, I thought, I think, you know, Dame's, the Facebook group, I felt like we really needed a conversation, a healthy conversation behind that. And so, you know, I'm grateful that you have been sharing some of your information and, and having healthy conversations behind this. So with that said, um, you know, the other areas of equity is the education we're doing right now, right? There's obviously facilitating conversations for moms now on the Denver Asian Moms Group, but, um, you know, how, how to support, what are some ways, maybe there are lots of parents out there right now that just feels uncomfortable about speaking up or perhaps they may, they may necessarily feel like this doesn't relate to me. I'm, you know, um, you know, it's not part of my, if I don't talk about it, then everything's okay. Is it okay? And how does that all, like, where do we all truly fit in in terms of when we put in that black screen on social media that says Black Lives Matter? Is that enough to say a hashtag and then that's it? I represent. I'm I'm against racism, but is that it? Is that enough? And I feel and I'm frustrated behind that <laughs> too. And so I wanted to be able to have a conversation about bring the conversation to that point too in terms of what has been your experience personally and then you know, taking your t experience professionally too and what you know, how can that, how can we start to shift, challenge ourselves a little bit now? Yeah, yeah, you brought up a lot of important points. Yeah. And in our society, it's so easy to be able to point the finger and say, well, they're the problem, they're the problem, they're the problem. Mm -hmm. The hardest part is to turn that finger back at you and at yourself and say, how am I the problem? What am I saying? What am I doing? What am I not saying? And what am I not doing? And to be able to integrate who you are is the hardest part. And like you, my, my parents, um, growing up, there is a lot of anti-blackness. Um, and we had talked about this. There is a term in Cantonese, hakwai, mm -hmm. which translate black ghost. Yeah. And so what does that mean? And how does how do we internalize that? Right? Going back to the images and, and growing up. So in my head, growing up, I had that term, but I knew as a kid when my mom would say that term, when my dad would say that term, I couldn't articulate what, what that it was wrong. I, I didn't have the words for it, I didn't have the language because I wasn't taught how to talk about race, I just knew it was wrong. And I knew in my heart as a child, like, no, we should be treating with everyone with respect. What have they done to you? You're, you're identifying them that way. And I am so proud of my mom. She has shifted her language. And I think with everything that's happening and lots of resources um, from Black Lives Matter and translated into different languages, my parents are able to to hear from the Asian community, right, from the Chinese and Vietnamese community, of hey, guess what? When when you say that, there's a lot of prejudice in discrimination that happens in that. We need to shift, and so I'm so proud of my parents to be able to shift that. Um, and and of course, all these years when I'm like, mom, really, you know, I'm trying to have those conversations with her. That wasn't changing her mind. When people want to change, it is really up to them. And so when it comes to when you want to change, that will happen. Um, and so I'm trying to think, there was, there was a lot in there that you had said. Oh, and I know, a ton of questions. Not, yeah. Right, and thinking about that. So yes, having those courageous conversations, it's up to that person. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about my own racial equity journey, it is mine and everyone is on their own journey. And we have to be mindful that it's not a destination. There, there's no there's no end, right? I'm constantly interrogating who I am in education, who I am as a partner, who I am as a mom, who I am as a neighbor, right? And the, it's always constantly changing. Who I was an activist like two months ago or even two weeks ago, very different because the more perspectives you get, and even just last night I was talking to one of my best friends and she's a lawyer, and already I have shifted my mindset of, wow, 
is it enough to just sign a petition? Is it enough to just do a black square? And the answer is no. That's a technical solution. Those are the check the box. I, I ordered my books that are diverse, check. I signed my petition, check. Um, and I uh, am, you know, um, having the black square. But racism, we need to recognize it's systemic and it's complex, and that's not the solution. The adaptive pieces is what systems are in place that upholds the privilege, right? That re the racial privilege, and we need to break that down. Mm -hmm. And so right now, it's amazing. A lot of companies are saying, whoa, this logo, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's racist. Mm -hmm. Well, good, mm -hmm. change it, yeah. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, hey, guess what, this textbook, in our classroom, it is from the Eurocentric perspective. It's not inclusive of all perspectives and the history is so narrow-minded just to recognize that we need to expand. Mm -hmm. That's adaptive pieces. So anything that we teach, anything that we say, mm -hmm. we have to be critical. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, we've all been brainwashed and conditioned to believe something. Yeah. Um, so we're constantly having to do that, to interrogate everything that we see. Um, and you just had shared actually a really, really, uh, actually powerful article with me. It was called A Challenge to White Silence and Racial Discussions. And, and in there it talks about whiteness theory, and perhaps you can actually share like a more succinct definition behind that, what that means. And also I feel like, too, for our listeners, what is racism truly? And because... When we think of, honestly, when I think of racism, I wouldn't say I'm a racist, right? Because I haven't done anything violent towards anybody or outwardly hurt anyone. And it's, it feels like, honestly, when we think of racism, it's only a certain population of people who, who are doing something physically um, or verbally abusive that that's considered racist. And obviously, um, there's so many, and there's a difference between racism and then there's also prejudice. And so I feel like that there, I guess, as a student, when do those concepts truly come in? What does that look like or in the context of, of it all? <laughs> and that's the thing that we need to reflect on is that I did not know the difference of racism, mm -hmm. prejudice, discrimination until I went to college. And so I was uh, part of the ethnic living learning community at CU Boulder. Mm -hmm. That was an amazing program that gave us language to really understand the system and the structure um, that we live in. Mm -hmm. And we need to shift that because children need to understand that. Yeah. Um, and understanding the difference, uh, and I was just actually looking um, because uh, I wanna, wanted to look up her name, a brilliant woman, um, challenged Merriam-Webster and said, we need to change what uh, racism or what racism is and what that means. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to have that working definition of what it means. And so if we're recognizing and accepting the idea that racism is systemic and it is allowing um, whites to be in control of the system, Right, and so when we're looking at all of the different systems, and when I say systems, we're looking at healthcare, we're looking at um, the justice system, we're looking at education, mm -hmm. all of the different institutions, we need to be critical who holds the power and who gets to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and then in, within those systems, we gotta look at, okay, well, who are, who are the oppressors and who are the oppressed? And so we're looking at racism, it is, a system that we need to look at. When you're looking at prejudice, that is uh, a belief. It could be positive, it could be negative, mm -hmm. but it's something that you are that you have against someone who is a different race from you okay. or a different culture of you, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we make that distinction and accept that racism, okay, the, the oppressors are white, mm -hmm. then you and I, as Asians, cannot be racist mm -hmm. because we don't hold the power. 
And I know there's that myth out there, Asians, you've made it. Yeah. We need to debunk that because I want you to go ahead and isolate race and how many CEOs, board members, owners of company, I mean, companies, I want you to isolate race and I want you to tell me how many Asians are actually there. Because where does that power, um, who is holding that power? It's gonna give you a different lens. And so Asians, I'm so sorry to tell you, <laughs> like we're not quite there yet. And um, you know, earlier when you had said, like we are sitting in this position um, and we need to recognize what does that mean to be Asians in this movement? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, absolutely. So focusing, obviously, both you and I, we're both Chinese Americans. And, and looking at all that, it's like, so we don't necessarily, you know, I, I guess in this particular article, you talk, it talks about um, whiteness and there's a degree in, in all of us, regardless of our race, do we have a sense of whiteness in us that maybe, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong in terms of how I'm understanding this, this frame, the, the definition. So whiteness is really about the normalcy of, of life that is so, when we talk about systems, so fixated that sometimes it's invisible to us in terms of how we perceive the world and how we understand the world that there is a dominant, predominant, um, um, uh, I guess the predominant white. It's and it's. I can notice my own personal struggle behind like just distinction of white versus black versus yellow. Us, you know, it's um, behind all of that. So how I guess trying to understand from that aspect of like what part of us have we are we blind? that we are actually blind or like as Asian Americans, um, I guess, what have I, what are we responsible for, I guess, in ourselves, knowing that, hey, we're not actually separate from all of this. We haven't made it like you had just pointed out because there's still a lot of oppression. Um, how does, and even like, even if, you know, we have all education levels, things like that, but how does this, I guess, it's a challenging, question for me to ask is how does how do we um, create a sense of how do we take responsibility how do we start to identify ourselves in all of this I don't know if that yeah, no, for makes sure. sense. yeah thanks for seeing yeah. me struggle through this <laughs> no, no because you were totally right and we had that co the conversation the other day yeah I want to make it very clear is that we all have whiteness within us because we have grown up, and I want to make it clear, in the U.S., if you look at our history, and I hope y'all are, you know, you're there, you're reading it. Yeah. This is 400 years, and, and, and this land we need to recognize is indigenous land. So when this, our government was set up, it was already a oppressive system. And so we all sit in that. We all grew up in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I would love uh, to acknowledge a lot of my equity work um, is because of Glenn Singleton. Mm -hmm. Check him out. He wrote a text, Courageous Conversations About Race. Mm -hmm. And he is a brilliant uh, man who has taught me how to use protocol. And a shout out to the Cherry Creek School affiliates. We're all affiliates with Pacific Educational Group. Um, and because of Glenn and because of my affiliates, we are constantly challenging each other and deepening our understanding of who we are and in this system. And so Glenn had defined whiteness. So there are three C's. It is your color. So you have, you could be, just the lighter your skin is, closer to white, okay? It would be whiteness. Mm -hmm. Then you have your consciousness. How are your thoughts similar mm -hmm. to white culture? Mm -hmm. um, and then the things that you do, we need to define um, that culture, right? So, sorry. So it's color, culture, and consciousness. So when you're thinking white, mm -hmm. um, and I was having a conversation with some someone, and when we think about what does it mean to think white, something that I have struggled with is that in the Asian community, we're very collective. It's all about family. We have to honor our ancestors. We have to come together. And it's not an individualistic idea. And so growing up, that was a part of my whiteness that I had this idea it's all about me and I can do this in this belief that it's just me mm -hmm. but that goes against 
Chinese culture. That is not the case. What we have grown up with is, no, don't stand out. Right. <laughs> We're together. Right. Right. But having to deal with that and to negotiate that, I'm having, as I was growing up, I had to come back to that and saying, wow, that is a part of whiteness, part of white culture to be individualistic. That is not true to who my family is and who I want to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, even, um, gosh, just the things that you do, right? I think the things that I watch, I mean, it's amazing over time. It, I am, I'm being more critical of what I'm watching, right? Because what is considered mainstream culture, if you isolate race to this day, it is not representative uh, and not inclusive. And, and, and there are a lot of stere stereotypical um, views of, of different races, right? Asians, you got your your nerds, yeah. you got your like dragon ladies, you have your masseuse, right there. And so I was really excited when Crazy Rich Asians came out. But of course, even with that, we have to recognize that even with that, with the, with that movie, there's a lot of criticism too, because it's not a critical, critical perspective, because even within Asians, that is a very East Asian culture. What about our brown Asians? You know, and in that representation, we need to be mindful of too. And so when I think about my color, I need to recognize that as an Asian, I am lighter skinned than my brown Asians. And I have to recognize the privileges that I have as I enter in spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to check myself. And I have to find the time to be able to listen and to learn different perspectives. Because as much as I would like to believe that I worked hard, I have to recognize that actually systems have been in place to get me to where I was. Like I think about, um, and shout out to some more programs out there that has really got me here. In high school, I was part of the pre-collegiate um, development program. They reach out to students who are first generation students. Uh, and they helped me understand how to take ACTs and SATs and got me to college. And then when I got to see Boulder, I had the ethnic studies uh, program and also ethnic living learning community. I, if I didn't have those programs, I would have been lost. And so we have to really check ourselves that are we really pulling ourselves by the bootstraps? Because really, if we're reflecting back, there are things in our system that has helped us as much as we might believe that it was just all you. Yeah. So in thinking about today, what systems are we uh, putting in place so our most marginalized communities get the support and access that they need? Um, so I guess that, you know, that, like when we start to ask ourselves what systems are in place or what systems are not in place, how do we start to, for a person that's probably maybe like not obviously in, in education or in policy, um, you know, what can we do in our everyday lives to start to have, to hold space for, for for safety, for support, for for others to invite more diversity, and you know, for me, you know, living in a predominantly white neighborhood and everything, do you, it's it's like, do I run out? And maybe like go and seek more diversity somewhere, and how do what does that look like? And I know that initially we talked about books for our kiddos as well too, but really, how do we start to kind of start to identify, I guess, incongruencies and in where we want to be, and how we want to support. Um, other races, including ourselves and honoring ourselves, and at the same time start to identify those beliefs and values that may no longer be true to us anymore. Sometimes because it's so automatic, we don't think about it. Um, you know, and sometimes we, because it's so uncomfortable, we may stick with stay with si just staying silence or not having a conversation about it, or just or just write it off and saying like, because for a while, honestly, for me, I kept thinking. Yeah, I'm Asian, but I get along with everybody, <laughs> so I'm okay. And really, truly, is am I okay? Um, and starting to to see where my limitations are on that. So, for an everyday person, how does that look? Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. For sure. <laughs> yeah. I think more and more that I'm hearing, a lot of people are having more diversity and inclusive committees, mm -hmm. and um, having those racial conversations. 
something that you can ask yourself is what missing what what perspective is missing at the table and recognize that so if you're in your committee meeting if you're in your board meeting what perspectives are missing and that is what we need to share right so if we're accepting the idea that racism is held um, by the oppressors right and, and in thinking about that then it's time to start listening and and include more people and when and, and when people of color are saying something instead of um, kind of ignoring what they said and denying it just be there to say that is your truth and believe it right with George Floyd and everything that's coming up it's always been there this is not new but the shift has happened because people are now believing it and unfortunately with how horrible it was for you to actually see it now people are believing. so wherever you are in your spaces and if someone is talking and they're sharing their lived experience and their feelings say okay i hear you and i accept that and that is so often that we just ignore and just say well no that's your truth and i don't care but then you're missing a critical perspective. And then the decisions that you make will be narrow-minded and it won't be inclusive because your decisions in the first place weren't including those perspectives. Um, and so that is something to do, uh, you know, that's something that you could do. And then when you talk about the white silence, I have been in a lot of spaces where I know there are white allies or white co-conspirators. But the thing is, what hurts more is, is when you don't say something. So, so when we think about that, if you don't say something, your intent might be, well, I don't have anything to say, um, I don't know much, I'm just gonna listen, but that silence allows other people to interpret what you're saying. And what we interpret silence is, is that you're in agreement. And so that's where we need to start leaning in and speaking up. And um, so often, um, we sit back and then things continue to happen and we wonder why something hasn't changed. Is because people aren't ready to make that change. And that change has to happen with you, it has to happen now. And so really making yourself aware um, because our behaviors drive our actions. And so being very grounded with what you believe um, and that will help you um, come to a decision that is really inclusive and helpful to everybody especially people of color. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that there are a lot of great texts. There's a lot of great theories out there right now. Um, what are some resources for people to explore this? And obviously, you know, this is not just for Asian Americans too, but just for Latinos, Blacks, um, Whites as well too, in terms of where can we start to, what can we start to read, what type of or groups can we start to have a conversation with and know that it's a safe space to explore that without feeling like you're being judged or, you know, um, in, in any way. And so, you know, what, do you have any organizations or resources that people can start to look into for that? Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. and to be honest, there's a lot. Yeah. And I think we need to recognize, it depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. Ask those questions. Yeah. What, where are you? in needing to build your knowledge and ask that question and you'll find a resource that goes with that. Mm -hmm. um, because there isn't a, I know right now everyone is reading how to be anti-racist, white fragility, right? They're all out there, mm -hmm. but it depends on your journey of where you are. And something I wanna clarify um, is that when we say safe, something that we need to be mindful of is that when we're having racial conversations, like we're having a racial conversation right now, and it could be uncomfortable, and we gotta recognize that. So, so we are physically safe. Mm -hmm. George Floyd and all the many others were not safe. So, so that is something that's also affecting people from having courageous conversations, and they shut it down by saying, "Well, this isn't safe. I don't feel safe to have this conversation with you." And that's what ends up happening. And so, we need to shift that in that culture, mm -hmm. in that we are physically safe. Mm -hmm. It might be uncomfortable. And that's going to be a new feeling for you. Yeah. 
But for us to have new learning, we have to sit in that discomfort. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, this ties into healing as well too. Physically, is in oftentimes if we're just even keel and we don't feel anything or we don't feel any pain, we're in our comfort zone, then suddenly we have a symptom and then all of a sudden it forces us to do something different and it challenges us to live differently and it's inconvenient, but that inconvenience and that process helps us to learn more about ourselves, whether or not we like it. <laughs> and so, you know, yeah, absolutely. I love how you described earlier about leaning in, don't be afraid. And I think part of it too is, is taking action to create a space to have conversation. For example, in the Danes group again, um, this, you're facilitating courageous conversations with um, Glenn Singleton's work as well too for a group of moms. And I think that's fantastic because otherwise where would I as a mom have a place to be able to have a conversation about that? To be very mindful about how I'm raising my son and always comes back to Rivers because he's my purpose. And so, um, you know, as, as far, you know, for the listeners out there right now, I know that it's uncomfortable to have a conversation, but chances are when you start asking questions and you're asking it rather than creating judgment, I think, too, and asking from a place of, I truly don't know. I really just, I just want to have, I want to get better. I want to learn. I want to learn something new. I want to break my, some patterns I, that I may not even see. If you, you never know who will walk back into your life or walk into your life, right? Like Yang and um, a few other people that I can think of as well too who, who have introduced me and just empowered me to be able to have conversations. And this is where you start to find your voice. This is about creating resilience because you're learning to be resourceful, learning to tap into truly who you are and being able to question what are some ways right now in my life that I'm being incongruent and that is creating resistance in my life and creating fear, creating worries. And the challenge is when we step outside our comfort zone is painful, but in the bigger perspective, as I, I'm hearing from Yu Ying, it's, there's also very freeing experience behind that as well too. And it makes you more grounded in who you are. So. Yeah, I know you had um, the intention of this healing. Mm -hmm. There is racial healing. And I think over the years, and my colleagues have seen it too, is that when those tears fall, mm -hmm. it's because I can finally let it out. So just kind of keep that in mind is that don't try to hold that in because that means you're repressing that internalized racism or, or internalized whiteness or whatever that may be. Sit with that, allow those tears to fall because you will become stronger um, and uh, and recognize the pain that's there. And I was before and I said, we need to start turning that pain into positivity and productivity. And so sit with that pain and then move on and understand where that pain came from. And that's how we can start changing. Yeah. That's a, sometimes when I have breakdowns and there's tears coming out, I, I like to rename it and say those are breakthroughs <laughs> because the tears can help you break through your own barriers. That's been challenging you so much that can be so loud. And then all of a sudden it's, it's a breakthrough that redirects our actions and our habits as well too. So, you know, um, Yang, I'm really grateful for your time today and sharing information. Um, usually I have a little title box in the back, but obviously Ying's there. So we have, and we have talked about this, it's okay for us to be able to share your email address as well too for our listeners who have questions or who want to be able to just reach out to someone and perhaps Ying can redirect you to someone that she knows um, or be able to find the right resources for you as well too. And so please reach out to Ying if you have any questions or if you're looking for resources or you're starting to ask questions yourself. And regardless of whatever race you are, I think it's so important to be able to just know that you can create a safe environment and you can be in control of that. Um, the email address for Ying is uh, ying, Y-I-N-G dot he dot chung. C H U N G at gmail.com, correct? And um, any any last words for, for before we take off for today, Ying? Yeah, since I have the world listening. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to be mindful um, of this, is that this work is not in the hands of people of color or of the oppressed. 
And so trying to keep that in mind, uh, try not to burden that person of color Take the time to be in your own affinity spaces and have those conversations within your race to also build your deeper understanding of what it means to be black, what it means to be Latinx, what does it mean to be white in um, in the context of the social construction of race, right? So if you are white, please don't, don't go to the people of color because right now I think um, we gotta be mindful that a lot of that trauma um, is happening and it's, it's continuously re-traumatizing the community. So just be mindful of that as you're interacting with someone. Um, yeah, because then, yeah, it, this time is a hard time. We, we need to support one another. Yeah. And then um, just take the time to build your own capacity and knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ying, for your time today. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, join us for next Friday, where Dr. Sam and I are going to be running the show together and uh, we are actually going to explore the neurology of free will which is a big it feels like a big uh, challenge project here for us to learn in the next week so but we're excited to be able to put some great material together and being able to share each of our pers personal perspectives and so look forward to being able to see everybody next week and um, enjoy the rest of your weekend and thank you again Yang I really appreciate your time Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. All right, everybody, take care.